That's way too much fun. Wait, let me get it one more time. <laughs> Today, we're gonna fire up the giant Cincinnati mill and cut an anvil with Will Stelter. If this is your first time meeting Will, he's a 22-year-old with a fiery passion for big tools, hot metal, and one of the most talented bladesmiths I know. He's traveled all the way from Montana to Spokane to get my help. I have a dimply old anvil that needs cleaned up. What does this thing weigh? <laughs> this weighs 395 pounds. It's made by Cole Swap. This company was started in the 1500s and they started casting steel in the 1870s, I think, or 1880s. But it was made in Sweden. I believe that it was probably an earlier model because of the lettering on the side. It looks to me to be stamped in um, as opposed to they did a, a much more clean casting later on. <laughs> Over three feet long, approximately 14 inches tall and a working surface of 23 inches. Yeah, by six and a quarter. First thing I'm noticing, what the heck are these marks from? Probably someone used this as a cutting table and blasted through and just took a couple little divots out of it in a couple different spots. I mean, it's still a totally usable anvil as is, but I plan on having this thing for the next 60, 70 years. And so if I get it cleaned up, then I'll have a perfect anvil for the rest of my life. I think we're probably only gonna have to take about three thirty seconds of an inch or so off the face. Historically, are we impacting it at all by removing the surface? Since this is cast steel, it doesn't have a hardened steel top plate that we're gonna be grinding through. And so we've got good hard steel, presumably fairly deep down in there. And we're only removing a very, very slight bit off the top. So we're not gonna be affecting its integrity at all, yeah. but we are gonna be making it a lot more usable. Those will transfer into your work, which exactly. we want to uh, eliminate. What about the edge? This is gonna now become sharper when we machine it down. If you have a real sharp edge, it's pretty easy to chip things out like you can see over here. Do any of these surfaces need to be surfaced? I don't think so. So this is the cutting table of the anvil. So if you were gonna do hot cutting with a chisel or something like that, that's where you'd do it. That area is surprisingly clean. It seems like they did more cutting on the face than anything else. Anvils of this size are a lot more rare in America. They're a little bit more common in Europe. In America, anvils kind of go between three to maybe $7 a pound on average. But when you get up to anvils, kind of the three, four, 500 pound range, that price can bump up depending on the manufacturer. And Colesois usually go for about $10 a pound or so because they're considered one of the best anvils ever made, partially because the cast steel quality is so high. And then also their horn is perfectly conical. How's the bottom? Is it flat? So it's fairly flat. It's not super duper flat. All right, so our goal then, get it on the big Cincinnati milling machine and get cutting on it. Awesome. I promise I won't break your tail light. I promise. Thank you. <laughs> okay, maybe I'll just wreck your trailer. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mr. Shop Scientist that I want to see how far the ball bearing rebounds. So rebound is essentially how far uh, a anvil specifically will send up a hardened piece of steel. And so it's hard steel on hard steel uh, and then the amount of mass that's underneath it will kind of determine how far back up that it's gonna send this ball. So what we're looking for is if you drop it from a height of maybe two feet, two feet, you're losing about two and a half to three inches. So depending on where it's hitting on the anvil, I saw the best of only losing two inches. I mean, this isn't really super scientific. No, I think we're getting pretty varied results. I bet that's because of the pock marking. So let's lift it up and then that way we don't have the ground dampening it. Exactly. See how it rings from there. You have a hammer. Oh my gosh, that's loud. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it is so loud. I can't believe how loud that is. So how are you gonna stop that? My current thought is to get it on my wooden base, trace out the pattern for it, okay. router it in, chisel it out so it's the exact right shape with a little bit of extra room around it, and then pour heavy duty construction adhesive around it. And it's the same as, well, better than that. Let's go see how loud your anvil is, just, just for some Let's reference. We can scoot mine out a little bit. 
Just <laughs> oh, had to tip over. <laughs> this is a Taylor and Sons anvil that I got from Andrew Alexander. He's pretty well known for having a pretty large collection of anvils. And there was just something about this one. I like big things and I just nev never seen one with this style. It's kind of rare to see, so. Especially in America. There's not very many of these in America at all. This is also about six inches wide and I only have 15 inches of working surface for the main face. And, and then uh, you've got this super useful tapered square horn on that side, which is nice. Whose anvil's longer? Are we in an anvil measuring contest here? <laughs> 39 oh inches, God. 13 inches. Ooh, How tall is yours? 14. Oh, dang it. 14 and a half. I think this weighs 400. You know how the code works, don't you? It's the English 100 weight system. Okay. So it's 3220, and so the first number is 112 pounds. So three times 112 is 336, plus two times 28 is 56, so three. Um, God, I need to get my calculator out plus 20 pounds. It's over 400 pounds with yeah. this anvil weighs. And then I put it on this big, heavy three-legged plate steel that's an inch and five eighths thick. And I think the base weighs 400 and some pounds just by itself. <laughs> <laughs> so it's this thing was forged at one point in England underneath some big steam hammers. So this whole thing was red hot, hot enough to forge weld together, which is nuts. The way I have this stuck down, I actually have construction adhesive called fuse it. So I fused it to the base. Yeah. Did I screw it up by doing that? No. People oftentimes use silicone to anchor down their anvils as well. That's another good dampener. Part of the reason why it's nice to have your anvil be deadened like that is it also means that when you're working, you're yeah. dumping all of the energy into the workpiece and not into making the anvil reverb. Okay. I haven't surfaced mine. I have like an eighth of an inch, sixteenth of an inch sway. It's low in the middle and high on the ends from just being used. I'm always afraid that if I deck it, that I'm gonna lose some hardness. But I do notice that when I do forge on it, that it is leaving impressions. Whatever whatever you're forging on is gonna get imprinted into your workpiece. Right. And so if there is pits in it, which wrought iron does pit like this, but you can actually fix that if you don't mind it by just sitting there and whacking on it with a hammer and flattening that down and it'll flatten it down huh. and work harden it a little bit. So if I were to deck this, I'm gonna get people say you screwed it up and then another crowd say that's okay. Yes, if it's gonna be more useful to you to have that be a dead flat surface, which I think it will be, mm -hmm. go for it. Oh, you didn't do the ball drop. Oh, so, so to see. I think because it's the hardened steel. Yours has better rebound. Let's go cut your anvil. Sweet. Let's do it. This is a 1957 Cincinnati number five milling machine. It weighs 18,500 pounds. It has a cutting capacity or envelope of five feet, two foot in the Y and about 20 inches in the Z. It has 50 horsepower and it is an absolute beast. Are there very many of these things around? I, this is the first one I've seen, but yeah, they made quite a few of them. And the six is exactly the same size as this, but a one foot longer table. This is exactly what this machine was designed to do, is face anvils, like it, it this is what it was made for. Uh, we have a couple choices of cutters, and I can show you those. The cutter I'd like to use is something with a carbide tooth, because the surface of that is probably gonna be pretty hard. And my go-to is this one. And, but I'm also looking at something wide enough to cut that in one pass. Fire this baby up. Lots of room. Okay, let's put the tool in. How would you even think about doing this by yourself? You gotta be strong. <sighs> okay. <sighs> Somewhere in there. Unfortunately, we just can't put the anvil on the milling machine and start cutting. The bottom and the top surfaces are not parallel to each other. If we were to cut, we would remove way too much off the surface on one side. The fix is pretty simple. The bottom of the anvil just needs to be shimmed parallel to the milling machine table. This is going to greatly reduce the amount of material removed from the surface. Some shop shims. Someone had a good idea to come up with these. Theoretically, if we throw a nice little fireball tool shop shim under this side, then we'll bump it up and we'll take kind of off the average of the face and hopefully get it evened out a little bit more. That aren't going anywhere. <laughs> 
Oh my gosh. I'm just gonna kiss it. There she is. Carbide is cool. It doesn't need coolant to cut properly. And it's happy cutting dry, using the material to transfer the heat into. It's also cool to see the chips perform that sparkler effect as they're flying through the air. Some of them even look like they're exploding. Two and a quarter inches per minute. Okay, ready? Here we go. Let's turn this thing off. So the first pass we took was about, what'd you say, Will? Uh, Probably about 3 30 seconds of an inch. And then we did a finished pass at 5 thou or so. That's the surface finish we got. It looks awesome. Steel must be extremely hard. I wish I had a remote hardness tester to test it. Let's see what we got. It's definitely more consistent. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. It's pretty dang good. What? Dang. This is awesome. Jason, thank you. Right on, man. Looks great. I think the surface turned out fantastic. I'm really happy with the results. I do think we made this anvil much more workable and made a huge improvement to the surface. I really look forward to seeing how Will uses this anvil in action. Be sure to check out Will's YouTube channel if this is something you're interested in and like to see what he makes with it.